Good morning, everybody. It's definitely a pleasure for me to, to be here to introduce you, uh, Joss Plotnick. Uh, we've known each other for a number of years now, but this is actually the first time we've met. So it's kind of very nice to actually put a human being behind the, uh, the name. Um, <clears throat> I have a program in Africa also working on elephants a little bit, but uh, they're forest elephants, so whenever I see the elephants there could be charging, so I actually don't see them very much. Uh, just as a bit of a background, Josh uh, basically did his uh, PhD at Emory uh, with uh, Franz Duval, uh, who probably many of you know from a lot of his popular writing. He went on to do a postdoc in Cambridge and then was a number of years in Indonesia before uh, coming back and he's now at Hunter College. So he's got lots of kind of rich information and uh, uh, data on uh, elephants. And he's switching a little bit and doing a lot of conservation work, which we share in common. So that should be really exciting. So without saying anything more, over to you, Josh. Thank you, Colin. Um, and thank you to Stephen and the other organizers for inviting me to the summer school. And thank you to all of you uh, for braving the Montreal heat and the Canada Day festivities and lack of transport to come here at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning. Um, so as Colin said, I, I've been working with elephants in captivity. Um, I actually spent the last, well, most of the last 12 years working in Thailand um, with Asian elephants in captivity. And so I wanted to start by kind of asking the question that I always get asked uh, or asking it of myself. Why do I study elephants? Right, this is usually the most uh, common question that I get asked because as a comparative psychologist, all, people often wonder how do elephants fit into the questions that we ask as psychologists. Well, the traditional comparative psychologists, and this goes all the way back to people like Robert Yerkes in the early part of the 20th century, um, are interested in understanding the evolution of intelligence in humans. So typically, comparative psychologists would look to our closest living relatives, and this would include the great apes, so chimpanzees, gorillas, orangs, bonobos, and other non-human primates like monkeys to better understand the evolution of human intelligence by looking at these animals and testing their cognitive abilities using experiments. The idea here is that if non-human primates like the great apes or monkeys demonstrate similar cognitive capacities to humans, and this might be in the realms of, of problem solving or cooperation, empathy, um, perspective taking, then the idea is that it, likely that our common ancestor with these animals going back several million years, probably also shared this same cognitive ability or capacity. But we might go beyond the primate taxa, and there's this exciting new or growing area of research we call convergent cognitive evolution, which looks outside the primate taxa at animals like crows. So this is, in, this is the corvid family, and inv includes species like crows, rooks, ravens, magpies, um, many dolphin species, and of course, Asian and African elephants. And the idea here is that these are evolutionarily distant animals. It's very unlikely, if not completely unlikely, that the common ancestor that these species share with us um, also shares the same cognitive abilities or capacities. This would be hundreds of millions of years of evolution, and our common ancestor with these animals is most likely a very simple organism, not cognitively complex. So what we're thinking is that, and, and many other scientists are asking questions about this as well, is that these animals did not come from the same common ancestor that had cognitive complexity, but they evolved in similar environments that required cognition in order to shape their intelligence. So this might be in the physical realm, animals evolved in an environment where they needed to be able to be complex problem solvers or complex um, physical thinkers, or they might have evolved in a complex social environment where there was a need for flexibility in their social behavior in order for them to navigate complex social problems. So that's really what drove me towards the elephant. This is an intelligent animal, um, but they're not closely related to us from an evolutionary perspective. So how did this happen and why? But what I really want to focus on today as I move through some of the cognitive tasks that we do is to get all of you to start to think about um, how we actually test these animals and why we make comparisons between humans and non-human animals. Traditionally, when comparative psychologists and developmental psychologists wanted to understand um, whether or not they could compare children, for instance, and chimpanzees, because that was the traditional model, they would design, let's say, a puzzle box, right? It's a physical puzzle box. You hand it to a child. There's a reward inside, and you say to the child, open this box, right? And the kid looks at it, and they manipulate it, and eventually they're able to open it up. You give the same box to a chimpanzee, and if the chimpanzee can do it, you say, yay, look, they share this problem-solving or tool use capability, right? But if we then take that box and we hand it to a crow or to a dolphin 
or to an elephant? Is it fair when they don't succeed in this task for us to make the same claim? Well, they don't do this. Chimpanzees can and humans can. So that must mean that the elephants and the dolphins and the crows are not cognitively complex in this realm. And I would make the argument, no, that's not fair. Because in many cases, these animals do not see, and I put this in quotes for a reason you'll see in a minute, do not see the world the same way we do. We have to do a better job of trying to take the perspective of the animal when we try to draw comparisons between species in terms of their intelligence, and you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. But one other thing I want to talk about is something I call an obligation to elephants. So as a comparative psychologist that studies an endangered species, and as many of you know, um, both the African and the Asian elephants on two continents are highly endangered. They're, on, they're in danger of going extinct within the next 25 to 50 years. So as a scientist that studies behavior and cognition, I'm always trying to take the work outside of the lab and directly into the field to try to figure out how our work can benefit conservation directly. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So because I only have 45, 50 minutes to talk to you guys, um, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the different experiments that we do. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about them afterwards if you have questions. But we've done a range of experiments to better understand how elephants think about their physical and social environments and how similar these behaviors are to our own. So we look at mirror self-recognition, and I will briefly touch on that in a second. Do elephants have an understanding of their self in relation to others? Do they have a self-other understanding? We also looked at body awareness. Do they have a self-environment understanding? In other words, do they understand that they have some ability to be an obstacle in their environment? And you would think that an elephant probably does because these are animals that weigh um, anywhere from five to 8,000 kilos. Um, they're quite large and they probably have an understanding of the fact that they can get in the way quite easily. Cooperation, we'll talk a lot about cooperation. Um, and this is, in addition to that self-other understanding, can animals, in particular the elephant, understand how cooperation works, understand their partnership with others. Consolation, this is linked to empathy. Um, I won't have time to talk about this today, but do elephants have an understanding of other elephants in distress and do they act on that? So if you recognize that another individual is emotionally upset or in distress, do you do something about it? And our research demonstrated that they do. Um, inequity aversion, I know Sarah Brosnan spoke here about a week ago. I'm gonna briefly touch on our work looking at fairness and an understanding of fairness in elephants. Um, object, object permanence and causal reasoning. Do elephants understand that something exists when they can't see it? And keep that in mind when we talk about seeing. But what I'm really gonna talk about today is vision, sound, and olfaction, right? So the idea here is can we parse out which sensory modality is most important to the elephant, right? If we wanna understand how smart elephants are, we have to be able to think, we have to be able to think like an elephant. Right? If we think like a human and provide these animals with tests that kids do well at, there's a very good chance the elephants will not do well at this. And one example I'm going to show you that we're pretty excited about is quantity judgment. Can elephants understand the difference between quantities using non-visual information? But let's start with mirror self-recognition. This is a video I love to show. Um, it's a clip that I took. We were doing an African elephant mirror self-recognition study um, in Botswana in Africa. Um, and we set up a mirror in the wild. Um, we had some semi-wild elephants that were interacting with the mirror, um, but also, also other animals that approached it. Um, and this is a male baboon. Yeah, I don't have it anymore. Um, but what you're gonna see here is this is a male that approaches a female in estrus. You'd think this would be the most interesting thing to him, but it's not because instead he's concerned about the fact that there's another male he doesn't recognize staring back at him. And this is most often what you see animals do when they first experience that mirror reflection, right? They see an animal they have never seen before. And so they do what they would normally do in a social context. Right? They threaten the mirror, they might throw things at it, they look behind it, right? I see this other animal, how come I can't physically interact with them? They look under it, they look over it. And this is actually the first stage that most animals in the animal kingdom never move beyond. Right? Whenever I give this talk to a public audience, invariably somebody raises their hand and goes, you don't know what you're talking about, my dog will look in the mirror. I should have said first that dogs do not recognize themselves in the mirror. There's been countless um, attempts to try and to see this. People will say, my dog recognizes themselves, 
right? And my response is, well, my parents used to live in an apartment building on the Upper East Side in Manhattan in New York City, um, and they lived on a high floor, and every time they'd come down in the elevator and the doors would open up, they would walk out with the beagle, our beagle, and there was a huge wall of mirrors, and immediately the beagle would go crazy and charge at the mirror, and this was over 10 years. Okay, so for some reason, this beagle never seemed to figure out that the dog staring back at him was himself. And all the animals tested in the animal kingdom do not move beyond this social stage, right? Some of them eventually give up and get bored because they're not getting any interaction, but other than chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangs, these are the animals, these are the uh, primates within the great ape family. Um, dolphins, tested with by Laurie Marino, who's in the room, and Diana Reese. Um, Asian elephants, which I'm gonna show you in a second, and one species of corvid, the magpie. And keep in mind that that seems to be, maybe coincidentally, maybe not, the same group of animals that we typically consider to be among the most cognitively complex. Animals that recognize themselves move beyond this social stage and they go to what we call mirror testing or contingency testing. The animal seems to recognize that the other individual in the mirror is not um, necessarily another animal, but they don't necessarily understand why that individual in the mirror is doing the same thing that they're doing. So you'll see rhythmic or repetitive behavior. The animal will be testing themselves. Any of you that have seen the Groucho Marx film Duck Soup from 80 years ago, there's a great clip in that film of Groucho and Harpo standing in a doorway and they're mimicking each other's behavior as if they're looking in a mirror. That's exactly what you see these animals do. They're asking themselves, why is that individual in the mirror doing the same thing that I'm doing? And then eventually they move on to things like this, self-directed behavior, similar things to what we might do. They inspect themselves, look at parts of their body they wouldn't otherwise be able to see without the mirror. Um, they might look behind themselves. They might look in their mouths. Some animals like us pick their noses. They put things on themselves. Orangutans, um, for instance, um, happen to be the only other species besides us that we know that self-decorate in front of the mirror. They'll go and get potato sacks and then put them on their heads to see what they look like. Um, but in the early 1970s, Gordon Gallup, a faculty member at the University of Albany, came up with an empirical way of looking at this a little bit deeper, right? You could look at this behavior and subjectively say, yeah, this chimpanzee recognizes themselves. They recognize that that image is a reflection of self. But he came up with an objective way of measuring this. He anesthetized the chimpanzee after they showed this self-directed behavior, marked themselves on their forehead so that when the chimpanzee woke up, they had no idea they'd been marked. They look at the reflection and they go, hmm, what's that on my face? And they try to rub it off. What do you guys think the chimpanzee might do if they didn't recognize that it was themselves and they thought it was another chimpanzee staring back at them? Exactly, yeah. They might reach out and try to touch the mark on the chimp in the mirror. And that's not what they did. They repeatedly touched the mark on their face. So we did this with elephants, and just because don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna skip to, uh, skip to the, the punchline. Um, elephants recognize themselves, they do touch the mark. Um, we don't anesthetize elephants, as you can imagine, that would be a crazy endeavor and we don't wanna do something like that. Um, so we adapted a design um, that Marino and Reese used, where we use a mark and a sham mark. The idea here is that it's okay if the animal recognizes they've been marked, because you go up to them, you put an X on their face while they're still awake, but on the other side of their head, you put an invisible X. With elephants in particular, this is really important because elephants have an organ, the trunk, which both has tactile abilities, but also olfactory abilities. An elephant can touch and smell with the same organ. So we use glow in the dark and white face paint for kids. The idea here is that the white X can be seen, the glow in the dark is invisible paint. So the elephant can't see it during the day. And according to chemists that we talked to, the olfactory information is relatively the same. Still don't have sound, um, but I don't necessarily need it for this video. Um, what you see here is Pepsi reaching up and touching the X on the right side of his face. And I say it's non-toxic kids face paint so that you can see even though he eats it, no big deal. Elephants like horses have vomero nasal organ on the top of their mouth. So they're able to gather a lot of olfactory information simply by putting the trunk tip in their mouth. And then you see Pepsi do a really big open mouth to look inside. So what does this mean, right? And I could, we could probably talk about this for an hour, um, but I'll just say, I don't really know. I don't think that we really know what mirror self-recognition tells us. What's really interesting about it, um, again, is that the only species that have demonstrated it conclusively, in my opinion, thus far, 
are the same species that we consider to be among the most cognitively complex, both in terms of physical and social behavior, but also those animals that show different levels of what we call empathy, the ability to emotionally put yourself in another's shoes. So the argument here might be that the ability to recognize yourself in a mirror is related to self-awareness, the ability for you to be aware of yourself in relation to others, the ability to be able to separate yourself from others, which would be a crucial component of empathy. You recognize that someone's in distress, you might feel the same way that they do emotionally, but you know it's not you in distress. You can separate yourself from them to be able to go and help them. So I wanted to continue to look at this self-other understanding in terms of cooperation. How do animals think about their social relationship? Most evolutionary biologists that are interested in understanding cooperation look at it from the ultimate perspective, right? And we have a very good understanding of how cooperation evolves in the animal kingdom from an evolutionary perspective. Um, we understand that cooperation is widespread in animals from ants to honeybees to lions to elephants. The way in which they exhibit cooperation differs, but the evolutionary mechanisms that I'm sure many of you know about include kin selection, so cooperating in order to benefit your genetic fitness, um, byproduct mutualism, lions cooperating together to get the same reward at the same time by taking down a gazelle, or the one that's a little less understood and, and relatively rare in the animal kingdom, reciprocity or reciprocal altruism, I help you in exchange for you helping me later. But what we don't know much about are the proximate mechanisms, right? For most of these animals, the ability or the capacity for cooperation is genetically programmed. I don't think there's much flexibility in cooperation when it comes to the insect world, for instance. But elephants, chimpanzees, other species, they might show similar levels of cooperation to us, and they might be more flexible in their cooperative decision-making. So this is one of my favorite videos. Can you guys see this okay? You'll see it play. This goes back to, it's cut off on the bottom, Crawford 1937, right? So we're talking 90 years. Um, one of the first studies done in the lab on cooperation. And what you see is two chimpanzees. These are young juvenile chimpanzees who are cooperating to pull in a box that's out of reach that would be too heavy for one chimp to pull. And the two chimpanzees cooperate to get the bananas on the top of the box. But what's really interesting is that when one chimp is hungry, that's the chimp on the right, and one chimp is satiated, the chimp on the left, the chimp on the right, as you guys can see, has to repeatedly recruit his partner on the left. Right, the partner on the left isn't as interested, so the partner on the right has to actually coerce his friend into helping him, and then, of course, he gets most of the reward. So this is the first demonstration, we think, of chimpanzees actually demonstrating that they understand something about how cooperation works. Right? If all this chimp knew is that pulling this rope eventually got them food, you'd expect that they would continuously pull indefinitely and never get the food reward. But the fact that they stop and actually physically try to get the partner to come over to help demonstrates a little bit more complexity. So we wanted to test this with elephants in Thailand. And this is part of my dissertation research. Um, and this is at the Thai Elephant Conservation Center, a government facility um, for elephants in northern Thailand. Um, and we adapted this design from a Japanese design because many of you are probably thinking right now, how would you do an experiment like this with elephants? Right, the chimpanzee study is done in such a way where you have a very heavy box that one chimpanzee cannot pull in on their own, but two can. I've seen elephants literally pull 747 aircrafts down runways. So very unlikely that in the field site in Thailand, I'd be able to come up with a box that was too heavy for one elephant to pull in on their own. So in this design, you have a single rope that feeds through and around a table. You'll see this in a second. So it doesn't require weight. All it requires is both elephants pull the rope at the same time, kind of like a pulley. If I pull one end of the rope without the other, it becomes unthreaded from the table. So you have a volleyball net here, um, and I'm sure many of you are thinking right now, how the heck does a volleyball net stop a 5,000 kilo animal from walking right up to the food? Of course it does not, but the elephants are very smart. They learn very quickly that this is a, an artificial barrier um, but they also don't like sticky things that they can't stick their trunk through. So it worked quite nicely. And the elephants can approach this. They can pull the ropes, pull this table in, and there's tasty corn in two buckets on either side of the table. Again, just to skip ahead to the punchline, I should add that this is a video-heavy talk and a data light talk. But of course, I have the data if anyone's interested to see it later. Um, this is after many trials, but 
not as many as you'd think, a few dozen. Um, and the idea here is that initially the elephants are trained to pull a rope, right? Doesn't take very long. I can train an elephant to pull a rope in captivity in less than 10 minutes. Remarkable, these animals work really closely with humans. Um, in Thailand, they've been working with their mahouts, the guys that take care of them, um, for hundreds if not thousands of years. And for most of these elephants, they have a single mahout for their entire lifespan. And after that, I release two elephants at the same time with these two rope ends. They pick up the rope, they pull them together. There's nothing necessarily cognitive in that, right? I've already trained elephants. When you see a rope, pull a rope. So the elephants get up to the rope together, they pick up the two ends, they pull together, they get to eat. The real fun comes when we release one elephant before the other. Because at this point, the elephants only understand when I see a rope, I pull it. And what happens is that very quickly, some elephants less than a dozen trials, the elephants learn that the table's not moving when they pull the rope. As soon as they get there, they have to learn that they have to wait for their partner's arrival before they pull. So this is an elephant female on the right who's waited 45 seconds already, patiently at the rope for her partner, um, a young bull, to arrive so she can pull in the, the table. And just because I don't have a lot of time, I will just add, in case any of you have questions, we do several controls here to really look at whether or not the elephants understand that it's the partner that needs to be there in order to do this work, or if it's something about the contingency of the table. Maybe they simply have learned that they need to wait for tension in the rope, or there's some other property of the rope that they need to understand. But we did some controls, and it seems that the elephants understand that a partner really needs to be there. But that wasn't as exciting as this, right? We often argue, how do you understand whether or not an animal is intelligent? How do you understand or recognize whether or not there's cognitive um, complexity in a particular behavior? And one answer to that is what we call behavioral flexibility. I think this is the only way you can really define through observation whether or not an animal is quote unquote thinking about something, is whether or not they change their behavior dramatically in a way that you might not expect, right? I told you I trained all the elephants to pull ropes and all the other elephants, in some way or another, got to the rope, waited for their partner to get there, and pulled in unison with their partner. But this five-year-old, all of a sudden, halfway through testing, changed her strategy entirely. So this five-year-old has been waiting for about 40 seconds. You see the elephant on the top arrive, and you will notice that the elephant on the top is struggling to pull in the table. That's because the elephant on the bottom has taken her front left foot, planted it on the rope, was holding it in place and forcing her partner to do all the work. So what's interesting about this is I watched these videos countless times and I cannot tell you at what point she picked this up because in the trials immediately preceding this trial, she did what everybody else did, right? She picked up the rope and she pulled it with her partner and in every trial after this one, she used this strategy. Right? And I will add that there's a reason why studying elephants in captivity is really difficult. And one is that you have to be very careful about the way you design experiments. You can't antagonize the elephants. Um, unlike chimpanzees, where we often set up situations where the chimps are in conflict, um, we can do this because, well, one reason is that their, their conflict behavior is often ritualistic. It's not necessarily deadly. Um, sometimes it can be. But also the chimpanzees are separated from us in what we call a protected contact situation, usually with bars. With elephants in captivity in Thailand, for instance, we work very closely with them. Put it simply, if you piss off an elephant, there's a very good chance that it's going to come back on you in a really bad way. So people often ask me, well, why didn't you make this more difficult? Maybe the elephant on the top would be less likely to participate if the table was too heavy, right? Maybe they would just give up. We can't do things like that for reasons I just explained. But again, this is really interesting because it demonstrated to me for the first time that the elephants were really flexible in their behavior. And to me, this is a pretty strong sign of their intelligence. But I wanna to jump to a different area of research that's still within the social domain, but this is an area that, it's, this is a single study that really drove my current and future research interests. And this is looking at how animals, in particular elephants, interpret social cues, right? The way this is typically done is with an object choice task, pretty simple task where you have, let's say, two choices. One choice has food in it, the other does not. And usually the human experimenter stands between the two buckets. 
They point at a particular bucket. Of course, usually it's the one that has the food in it. They might point at it. Sometimes we orient towards it. Sometimes we do both, orient, gaze, and point. And the idea is to see whether or not an animal will follow that social cue. Dogs are really good at this. Chimpanzees are not good at this. Obviously, human children are good at this. Wolves are not good at this. Should have put dogs and wolves at the same time so you could see the relationship. Dogs good, wolves not good. Chimpanzees not good. Many other, I'm going to jump ahead, domesticated species are good at this. So the argument in the literature is that through what we call the domestication hypothesis, these animals um, have evolved through artificial selection the ability to pay very close attention to human social cues. Whether or not people artificially selected for these cues or not, we don't know. It's more likely that people selected for particular cues when they were um, domesticating these animals um, that eventually led to animals being very good at picking up social information that people were providing them. Makes sense, right? You would want to breed a dog that was very attuned to your own um, cues. So we wanted to test this theory using elephants. Elephants have never been domesticated. There has never been any sort of artificial selection for particular traits in elephants. There is no separation between the elephants in captivity in terms of genetic makeup and the elephants in the wild to our knowledge. But as I said, elephants have been working closely with people for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And if you talk to the elephant handlers, their mahouts, they would tell me that the elephants absolutely follow points. They told me we point at things all the time and the elephants are always following that point. So we decided to test this. And I'll come back to this a little bit later, but this is a study that I designed with middle schoolers. I said early on that I would talk about how we use our work for conservation. One way is direct conservation in the field. The other is what we would call conservation education. So we use our research to encourage young people to get more involved in animal behavior research, also to get more involved in conservation of wild animals. So this is a study that we designed with New York City middle school kids. Um, these are 12 to 14 year old children. They designed the study with us. They carried it out with us um, via Skype in Thailand, and then they co-authored, so most of the authors here are 12, 13 years old, they co-authored the paper that we published as a result of this. So it's getting young people to not only learn about conservation and animal behavior research, but to get involved in it directly. So this is the typical object choice task, right? One bucket has food. Um, and if I'm ever famous for anything related to elephants, I think it's going to be figuring out that I have that no elephant on the planet doesn't like sunflower seeds. So it's a very cheap food resource, right? I should also say that elephants eat 250 kilos of food a day, right? So if you're a researcher trying to study elephant intelligence and trying to give them food rewards, you either have to have a really big unlimited budget or you need to come up with a cost-effective food. Sunflower seeds work really well. So here's the first task. This is a mahout and he's going to indicate to the bucket that has food in it um, to see whether or not his elephant will respond. His elephant is a, at this time, three and a half year old elephant named Am. You're gonna hear her say her name. Other than saying her name, he doesn't provide her any other information. <laughs> we tested 12 elephants on this in Thailand and none of them, as a group, scored significantly better than chance. So I'll get to why this is important in a second, but a study that followed ours done with African elephants showed that the African elephants were actually pretty good at this. They were able to follow that social cue using a different methodology. We replicated that methodology in Thailand um, with one of my Thai students a couple of years ago. Difference in the methodologies, you're seeing repeated gazing towards the correct bucket with the point. This is outside, so better lighting. And the elephants weren't good, in he weren't good here either. Um, two reasons why we might see differences between the African and Asian elephants. One is I think there's still some methodological issues between our two studies. The other is potentially ecological. African elephants, at least the elephants tested, savanna elephants live in open plain areas where it might be much more important to see visual information, whereas Asian elephants live in dense forests where visual information might not be as important. I'm gonna go with the former explanation. I think there's a methodology issue. But why is this important? Well, as soon as I did this study, the mahouts, the guys that take care of these elephants, got really pissed at me. Um, they said, why are you trying to show us that our elephants are stupid? We told you that the elephants follow points all the time. So that got me really thinking about 
trying to figure out how to take the elephant's perspective. So I asked the mahouts, at what point do you point and get elephants to pick something up? And they said, well, for instance, um, we have tourists that get on the elephant's back. They ride on the elephant's bareback. Um, and they take the, the elephants take the tourists into the river to bathe. And as soon as they go into the water, usually the tourists drop their flip-flops on the bank of the river. The elephants go in with the tourists. The tourists bathe the elephants. They come out. And as soon as they come out, the mahouts point at the flip-flops, the footwear on the ground, and tell the elephant to pick it up. And the elephants pick up the flip-flops and hand it to the tourists on their back. And this got me thinking, well, what if it's not the point that the elephants are following? Maybe it's the other sensory information that the mahouts provide, right? At this point, the elephant is listening to the mahout's voice. They have very big ears, they're able to localize sound, and the mahout is directing their voice towards the ground, right? So maybe they're able to localize the direction of the mahout's voice, the elephant puts their trunk in that direction, and guess what? As I said, elephants have a really good sense of smell, and you'll see that in a minute. So as you can imagine, human feet have a pretty distinct smell, so the elephant hears the mahout's voice and directs their trunk to where they can smell the object the mahout wants them to pick up. Okay, so let's try and test this a little bit. One, food has, one bucket has food, one does not. I'm sure you can guess which one has food, if you can all hear pretty well. And none of the elephants perform significantly better than chance on this either. Now, why might you think that would be? I said elephants have a really good sense of hearing. Based on this experimental design, what do you think could be going on? The last place you saw the uh, master of Yeah, good point. We control for that, but good thought. Think, and I don't expect that you all know that much about elephants, but elephants are primarily herbivores. Think about their food and think about what I'm asking them to do in this experiment. To my knowledge, plants don't make sound. Certainly not enough that the elephants are listening for the call of plants in the wild, right? So yes, that is one potential issue. Um, but we weren't trying to figure out whether or not the elephants um, could learn this. I, I'm pretty sure they would if we had done enough trials. I wanted to see inherently if the elephants would follow acoustic cues to find food, right? And I would argue that I think that primarily the elephants from an ecological perspective are using acoustic information to communicate with other elephants. Right? They have a very complex communication capacity. Um, they can communicate over long distances. They can hear infrasonically. We understand that they're able to gather infrasonic sound through their foot pads, so seismic communication. It's quite remarkable, but from a physical food perspective, it's unlikely. It's more likely they're using olfactory information. So really basic setup, same idea here, object choice. Now we put lids on these buckets, we lock them in place, and we drill holes in the top. Right? So the elephant can't see the food, they can't hear it, all they can do is smell it. So the elephants are presented with these two buckets. They have an opportunity to smell both first. We then pull the buckets back, unlock the lids, and allow them to make a choice. And all the elephants scored significantly better, better than chance here. And I, I will add that this is an elephant you'll see a lot in my videos. His name is Pepsi, 10-year-old bull. Um, one of the best test subjects for several reasons, but something remarkable that many of you that might do experiments with animals will see um, is the patience of an animal like this, right? The fact that you present them with food, don't let them get access to it right away, pull the food back from them, and they still wait patiently to get access to it, um, it's pretty remarkable. I can say that with chimpanzees, this would be a very difficult paradigm. So why does this matter? Well, I said early on that what's really important to me um, as a comparative psychologist is try to figure out how we can compare cognition across species by giving animals like elephants a fair opportunity to solve a cognitive task. And what I'm going to argue is that it makes sense that in order to do this, we can't simply give them visual tasks. The reason an elephant do doesn't follow a point is because visual information 
is not their primary sensory information when they're making social decisions, or I'd argue when they're making physical decisions. They're using non-visual information like sound and smell. So one simple iteration above that would be to look at whether or not elephants can infer the location of food if you only give them limited information. This is a really common task. A lot of animals can do this. To my knowledge, the only species that have been tested um, to do this do it within the visual domain. So what you do is same idea with the olfaction test, except you only present the elephant with one bucket on the table. And in this case, it's the bucket without food. So the elephant smells that bucket. They don't have access to the other one. They get an opportunity to... And that head bobbing behavior, in this particular case, is anticipation. This is not a behavior this elephant does in any other context. So again, an elephant that's pretty aware of how this test works. We then unlock the lids and the elephant gets to make a choice and he chooses the bucket he has not yet investigated, right? So one less parsimonious explanation, the more complex one, is that he has inferred that the location of the food is in the bucket that he has no access to, right? He would have to understand first that one bucket has food and one does not. I would argue that he does understand this. He's been given countless trials of this paradigm before. But the more parsimonious explanation that's less cognitive is that the elephant has simply learned to avoid the negative stimulus, the negative stimulus being the bucket that doesn't have food, right? I'm not making any outrageous claims here about intelligence, simply saying this is really the direction we want to go in. We want to start to test elephants in a sensory domain that makes sense to them. So why does olfaction matter, right? And it matters because from an ecological perspective, smell is really important to elephants. Elephants are able to recognize whether or not there's an approaching predator by smelling them sometimes several kilometers away. They're able to communicate with other elephants using olfactory information. There are some studies out there recently done in Africa that demonstrate that elephants are able to recognize the urine smell of several hundred elephants that are both in front of them and potentially behind them, right? So this is a really important sensory information capacity um, for elephants, and this means that this is really what we should be using to test them in captivity. So one study that we're writing up right now that I'm really excited about is quantity discrimination, right? Most studies that look at quantity discrimination, the ability for an animal to tell more from less, right? I show you six apples, I show you two apples, can you tell the difference between them? I'm sure you can. Most animals are able to do this with varying um, ability and capacity, but to my knowledge, none have been tested in the olfactory do domain. There are some studies um, on rodents and voles, for instance, that look at the ability to use olfactory information um, when in, in relation to uh, mating systems in terms of quantity, but nothing in terms of food, which I think is most important for an animal like an elephant. So these are two buckets that have food in them. Which one has more, which one has less? This one? That's a trick question, they both have the same. Um, I did that because I didn't want any of you to get it right, but I assure you that you can't. It's very, very difficult. We did this, we did a, a pilot with children. It's very difficult to look um, at very closely um, aligned quantities to be able to tell the difference between them. What we wanted to do with the elephants was test this. Same similar paradigm, two buckets, both have, in this case, both of them have food, right? The elephant gets to smell the two buckets and then has to make a decision about which one has more. This is Pepsi again. See how little information he needs to gather in order to make that choice? And this is not a very good example of this experiment. It just happens to be the only video I have because when I've shown this before, people have said, well, wait a minute. Maybe he's using acoustic information. You guys all saw him bang his trunk on the top. Maybe he's listening to an echo. This is the only trial that Pepsi did this in. He was a little bit anxious. Um, typically, the elephants don't touch the buckets at all. They simply wave their trunks over the top of the buckets, and they make a choice. So I'll keep this data pretty simple. Sorry, it seems to have gotten cut off in the projector. But y-axis is percent is probability of success, and x-axis is what we call disparity. Right? How do we define disparity? Well, if you look at the top here, typically when we test quantities, we're looking at ratio. Right? So for instance, one versus six represents 30 sunflower seeds. 
versus 180 sunflower seeds, whereas five versus six represents 150 versus 180 sunflower seeds. As you can guess, 30 versus 180 is easier than 150 versus 180. And this is true across all quantity discrimination studies, both with humans and non-human animals, that the closer the quantities are together, the more difficult it is to tell them apart. Um, what I want you to pay attention to is you see a lot of raw data values, right? What's interesting here, and I should say that the purple and the orange represent predicted values. The purple is, or blue, are uh, males. The orange is females, so one takeaway message here is that males may be better at this than females. I will add a caveat. We have a pretty small sample size. I'll tell you in a second why I think the males may be better at this. But what's really interesting is, yes, you do see that the farther apart those quantities are, the easier it is for the elephants to get it. But look all the way to the left, right? 150 to 180 sunflower seeds, we're still seeing some elephants scoring in the 80 to 90% range. That's really remarkable. Right? The fact that elephants can briefly smell 150 versus 180 sunflower seeds and choose the higher quantity means that olfaction might not only be really important for elephants, but it might be their strongest sense. It might be, um, and I, don't, I can't make this argument now, but olfaction in the elephant may put them on par with some of the best olfactory animals in the animal kingdom. Why males might be better than females? One argument is that males are typically bigger than females. They might have more motivation to reach that um, energy requirement of 250 kilos of food a day, so they might be more motivated to pay attention in this task than the females. Just conjecture, we don't have enough data to show that. But this is really exciting for me because it really seems to indicate that if we want to better understand the cognition of elephants and other non-visual animals, we really have to find ways to put, them, put ourselves in their shoes. So what are some next steps? I'm going to continue to study um, elephants in captivity. Um, this is a great way of really kind of better understanding how they use non-visual sensory information to make decisions. Um, so I built this facility in northern Thailand, which allows us to bring elephants voluntarily into this situation. Typically, the elephants are um, out in the field, but they come in here. They get to participate with us in these experiments. Um, the experimenters are protected from the elephants, so if the elephants want to lash out, at least during the experiment, they can't. So one example of this, um, how many of you were here for Sarah Brosnan's talk? All right, not everybody. I'll just quickly show you this video. I'm sure you have seen it um, before, but it's looking at inequity aversion. Sarah Brosnan did this research um, in Franz de Waal's lab at Emory University. Two capuchin monkeys, right, both happy to participate in exchanging a rock for cucumber, right? They're happy to eat the cucumber as long as their partner's getting the cucumber. But as soon as the partner gets a grape, which is a higher quality food for the capuchin monkey, you see a change in behavior. So the capuchin monkey on the right is going to get the grape. Capuchin monkey on the left is going to get the cucumber. and the capuchin monkey is not happy about it, right? So we wanted to look at this in elephants, but again, add the caveat here, this task requires a lot of attention to visual information, right? The capuchin monkey needs to see what food he or she is getting and what food his or her partner is getting. We can't assume that the elephants are recognizing this, so we implemented what we call an olfactory box, problem-solving box. So every time an animal was presented with food, we put it in a box with the loud, which allowed the other elephant to smell what that other elephant was getting. In other words, I present you with a particular food item, I provide that food item for the other elephant to smell so that they can learn when he or she is getting the same reward. So just to skip ahead here, the elephant on the left got sunflower seeds mixed with M&Ms, perfect high quality food for an elephant. The elephant on the right gets cornflakes. Perfectly happy to eat cornflakes in another situation, but when the partner's getting sunflower seeds, the question is, are they still as happy to participate? They don't throw things at us. They just refuse to exchange the token back. But I should add, this is the only elephant that did this. All the other elephants were happy to eat the cornflakes. Again, what's the problem here? Elephants eat 250 kilos of food a day. Cornflakes, sunflower seeds, it's all high quality food. It's all a treat for an elephant when most of their food is grass and boring vegetation. 
right? So you really have to think like an elephant. How do we test them in an environment where food rewards might not have differing qualities or, or, or value? Object permanence, right? This is a study I was doing with, with a graduate student looking at whether or not elephants can understand that something does not exist, uh, that something still exists even if you can't see it. The best example of this, for those of you that don't know about object permanence research, is peekaboo, right? If you play peekaboo with a baby that's six to 12 months old, put your hands over your eyes and go peekaboo, the kid is really surprised all of a sudden that you've now no longer exist and all of a sudden you exist again, right? That's why they're so excited by that. That, that game. Once they reach 18 to 24 months, they recognize that you're still there even though they can't see you. We wanted to see whether or not elephants could do the same thing, so we combined visual information because the object permanence task really relies on it with olfactory information, and you'll have to stay tuned for those results since we're still looking at them. I wanted to just add something in here um, because I said earlier that it's really important for those of us that study the evolution of intelligence in animals to try to figure out how to use our research for conservation. So I had a master's student who was working with me in Thailand who got really interested in this animal, the pangolin. Many of you may never have heard of this animal. Um, this is the most trafficked species in terms of wildlife poaching on the planet. Um, thousands of pangolins being taken from the wild on a weekly basis. And what's really devastating is that we know virtually nothing about them. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. There has not been a single behavior or cognitive study on these animals to date. So we wanted to look at how these animals use olfactory information and whether it was similar to elephants. And you might be asking, why is that important? And I'll tell you in a second. This is a night vision camera. These are nocturnal animals. That's a motorbike in the background. But if you listen carefully, you can probably hear the snout going. If you can, I'll show you a, a different recording in a second. Object choice task here, right? Bucket on the left has food, bucket on the right does not. The food are dead ants. This is a wildlife rehabilitation hospital, so whenever the pangolins are confiscated by the Thai authorities, they're brought to this hospital to be rehabilitated before they're re-released into the wild. And we wanted to understand whether or not the pangolins were using olfactory information to find food. Now you might be thinking, why should we care about this if they're about to go extinct? Well, we should care about this because we don't know enough about their behavior to protect their habitat. So one of the big things that we wanna ask by studying their olfactory abilities here is to see whether or not we can protect habitat that's most important for pang pang pangolins in a particular location to potentially isolate that habitat and patrol it extensively. Because right now the pangolins are taking up huge swaths of land. Um, we don't know where they are. We don't know how to track them. The poachers are much better at finding the pangolins than we are, and they don't have a defensive mechanism that works. When pangolins are threatened, they roll up into a ball, which is perfect for a poacher, right? Roll up into a ball, they pick the pangolin up, and they put them into a bag. So, right, so if we can understand how pangolins use their olfactory information to find ants, at what distance do they need to find their food source, how do they select food sources, that gives us a much better opportunity to identify and protect necessary habitat. This is the first time after several months that this pangolin had been given live ants that we caught. It just gives you an idea of how they use their olfactory information as soon as they hone in on a food source. This is a GoPro attached to the, to the pangolin's back. If you want to take an animal's perspective, the best way to do it is put a GoPro on their back. So um, just going to finalize the talk here, finish up with a couple more points. Um, I want to continue to study cognition in a controlled laboratory setting, but I also want to find ways to apply cognition research to conservation and practice, to take cognition research out of the lab and bring it directly into the field. The biggest problem that elephants in Asia face, unlike African elephants that are dealing with poaching for their ivory, in Asia it's human-elephant conflict. Not enough land for elephants, too many people encroaching on elephant habitat in national parks. The elephants are leaving their national park habitat and raiding crops that farmers are planting on the edges of these national parks. What do we typically do about it? Well, typically we set up barriers. We set up electric fences, we build trenches, we move trouble elephants from one location 
to the next. And these strategies work temporarily, but not long term. And that's, in my opinion, because we don't think about elephant behavior. We don't ask questions about why elephants are doing this in the first place. And I'll get to this in a second, but if you think about this really carefully, you might understand that not understanding behavioral information about these animals means that the elephants are being set up to fail from the beginning, right? Most human-centric strategies like electric fences, trenches, firecrackers, shooting guns over the air above an elephant's head are entirely based on fear conditioning, right? But it doesn't deal with the inherent problem that the elephants have some reason for raiding the crop in the first place. If you tell a child that they can't have a tasty candy, what are they gonna do? Try to find a way to get it. Even if you threaten them with some sort of punishment, the child still has that inherent desire to get the food, right? So they will still find a way to do it. You're not dealing with that inherent need. So why does behavior matter for elephants? Well, let's think about some of these strategies that are already employed, right? Translocation and drives, right? Why does taking an elephant from one location, let's say you have an elephant that's a really good crop raider, right? Every night they violently attack an electric fence, they raid crops, they charge at people. So the response is let's take that elephant and move them to a completely other location so they're nowhere near my crop. Well, if you think about elephant behavior, you'll understand that they learn very well socially. They're very social cooperative animals. So you just increase this problem. You take a trouble animal, you move them to another location, they continue to do their bad behavior and all the other elephants go, ooh, that behavior works really well. And now you've spread the behavior from one population to another. Electric fences. If you understand that elephants are really good problem solvers and potentially have the ability to be insightful, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute, you'll recognize that they can knock over an electric fence with ease. I've seen a video, which I don't have, of three bull elephants standing in front of an electric fence. And all of a sudden, the biggest bull elephant walks behind the smallest and shoves, her, uh, shoves him into the electric fence, right? Knocks, his, knocks the electric fence over, the baby elephant gets electrocuted. It's not a pulse that kills them, it just scares them off. And the bull elephant, the big bull elephant, steps right over the baby into the crop, right? That's pretty remarkable problem solving behavior. And again, none of these methods deal with the fact that the elephants have an inherent need to get on the other side of that fence. So I'm interested in setting up research in the field to try and figure out whether or not there are individual differences in crop raiding behavior. In other words, what makes a crop raider raid? Why do some elephants raid crops and others do not? This is a bull elephant in Sri Lanka standing in front of an electric fence. Right, so not very effective. And yes, there are electric fences that are built better than this, but in my, in, in my experience, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how well the electric fence is built, the elephants um, identify and then exploit issues with electric fences. These electric fences sometimes run for several kilometers in a tropical, dense forest environment. You can expect that very quickly if the fence is not well maintained, and in second and third world countries, they often are not, it's very easy for an elephant to get over it. So I'm working in a part of Western Thailand called the Salak Pra Wildlife Sanctuary. It's all the way on the Thai-Burmese border. And we're gonna set up several um, watchtowers that look like this in crop rating towers, because to my knowledge, um, there's very little research looking at whether or not you can actually observe elephants while they crop raid, right? If we're gonna make the argument that elephants are intelligent, then we might also be able to make the argument that there is behavioral flexibility and personality differences in elephants that might allow us to observe elephants during crop raiding, to actually figure out what makes a crop raiding elephant a crop raiding elephant. We're gonna complement this with cognitive tasks. So we're actually going to build watchtowers deep in the forest and actually set up puzzle boxes or problem solving tasks to look at whether or not elephants approach these boxes differently. Some elephants might be more risk prone versus risk averse. Some might be leaders versus followers. Some might be more destructive, some might be more hesitant and gentle. These are all traits that we might use to better identify personality differences. Now, the stage I really wanna to get to and we're not there yet, is can we use this information to actually help elephants make different choices, right? If elephants want the crop on the other side of the fence, they're going to find a way to get it. What if we can find a way to use this behavioral and cognitive information to convince the elephant that there's another choice somewhere else? Open question I hope we'll get to 
later. So I just want to finish the talk um, by jumping to conservation education and just kind of plug some work that we're doing. I, I argue again that as scientists, it's really important, um, especially if we're evolutionary biologists or comparative psychologists that are interested in stunning the, understanding the evolution of animal behavior and intelligence. Yes, this is really important from a psychological perspective to understand the evolution of human behavior and intelligence. But if we're studying endangered species, I think it's also imperative that we use this re research to not only educate the public and get them more interested, but also to engage young people, the next generation, in conservation. So we run programs in the US. We run programs in Thailand. Obviously, it's easier to bring the elephants directly to the kids in Thailand. We do research around this work. So we've designed a conservation education program um, that spans several hundred activities. It runs for anywhere from one year to two years in schools, primarily middle schools. We do um, a survey analysis to look at whether or not the children's values and understanding of natural resources, the environment, and elephants changes over time. We're less interested um, in what knowledge they retain, right? And in Thailand, rote memorization is the way in which all these children learn facts, still is in the West as well. But we're more interested in seeing how their values change over time and whether or not we can have an impact on how they think about the world around them. So we do a variety of activities. This is a food chain game, getting them to think about how their behavior affects other animals around them. Um, with kids in the United States, we bring the elephants into the classrooms via Skype. Um, we actually bring the elephants right up to the computer. We do vet checks, right? So we bring the veterinarians into the facilities to um, look at the welfare of the elephants, but also get people to interact with the elephants directly. But some of our activities actually involve getting the, uh, the children to think like an elephant, right? So I said the elephants are highly olfactory animals. So we get the kids to block out their visual ability, right? We blindfold them, which is for us a, a pretty significant deficit if we're trying to identify food or interact with others so that they can try to take the perspective of the animal that we're looking at. So just one example of a game that we do, and I, I give this example every time I give a talk actually, because if any of you are thinking, well, how can I help, whether it's with elephants or other an any other animal, this is a great game that you can play with kids. We call it the saving space game. Um, it works for any sort of human wildlife situation because all of the animals on this planet face the same problem. Effectively, it's kind of like musical chairs. You take a newspaper, you put it on the ground, and you have the kids walk around the newspaper as the music plays, and as soon as the music stops, they jump onto the newspaper, right? I should add that what we tell the children is half of you are elephants and half of you are humans, right? And every iteration of the game, we fold the newspaper in half. So eventually the kids are jostling to get on the newspaper and shoving each other off. And at the end of the game, we ask them, what'd you learn? And it's a pretty simple game, but the kids get it, right? We've learned that the biggest problem is that we don't have enough space for the elephants and we don't have enough space for the people. This is what the game looks like in case any of you can't picture it. So, you know, just a final point here, and I'd be happy to take questions. I think, you know, as again, as a comparative psychologist, uh, evolutionary biologist, I am, as a scientist, really interested in asking questions about the evolution of, of complex cognition and intelligence, and I use the elephant as a model. I mean, as I said earlier, I think this is a really important question in terms of converging cognitive evolution, understanding how and why we see cognitive complexity across a wide range of taxa in the animal kingdom. Um, but that's my psychologist hat. Um, I'm also really interested as a conservationist to try and figure out how we can take that research out of the laboratory and apply it directly to conservation research in the wild. Um, and as an educator, which I think all of us as academics, of course, are, um, I'm really interested in trying to find ways to take this research out of the lab, into the field, and into classrooms. Because I think psychology in particular, but also biology, um, and of course, education has an opportunity to not only improve the lives of humans and non-humans, um, but also find a way for us to 
to, with, at the risk of sounding cliche, to coexist with, with animals and find ways to, to deal with the um, conservation crisis that we currently face. So with that, I will say thank you to everyone that I've worked with, and thank you to all of you for, for listening. Okay, that's great. Let me just say thanks. Like we learned a lot uh, about you know, the psychology of things, conservation, and education. I'll give you two little anecdotes from, from African elephants that I've been working on. I don't see my elephants very much at all. Uh, when I first started studying them, I was looking at seed dispersal, and lo and behold, they were feeding on little green cucumbers, basically, and they were they were amazing at finding. I couldn't figure out what they how they found it. It was just amazing how they could find it, and it was growing on the ground. Just amazing how they could find. Second thing, in uh, Kibala National Park where I work, we uh, tried to uh, dissuade the elephants from coming to crops. So we built, I think, something like 70 kilometers of uh, trenches so the elephants can't crop through, can't walk through them to get to the crops. The trenches are pretty effective. The, the elephants don't go through them. Um, they just go around them. They'll walk maybe 10 kilometers, get to a swamp, cross at the swamp, because you can't dig a drench, trench in the swamp, and they'll come back to the crops. So pretty amazing animals. And just to remind you, we can take some questions. Uh, people kind of go up to the mic, please. We'll kind of take it that way. I will just quickly add about this photo. Um, don't ever do this. <laughs> this is a two-year-old, the girl is two years old, um, and she's the daughter of the Mahout that raised this bull elephant. This is Pepsi again. So you can see how incredibly gentle these animals can be. Again, you know, she's, she, this is, this photo is eight years old, so she's now 10. Um, and she still does this stuff with Pepsi. Um, but they have a very close relationship. They were raised together. Um, extremely intelligent animals, in my opinion, but also extremely dangerous. So unless you're raised in the household with an elephant outside in your backyard, don't do that. Just go back and forth, I guess. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Hi. Um, th thanks for your talk. I, le I learned a lot. <clears throat> um, I, know, I know this wasn't the main thrust of... of you're getting at, but um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the um, inference versus avoidance uh, cups task you did. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm really interested in this uh, in this paradigm, and um, I was wondering, uh, and I've I'd never heard heard of it used uh, just with a faction before. Um, um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit uh, more about how you controlled. I mean, w w if you thought it really was evidence for inference rather than avoidance, and um, Secondarily, if you tried it with uh, three cups rather than two, uh, since um, I've seen research by Sue Carey uh, using the three using the three cups task as a way to rule out the possibility of merely avoiding um, the empty cup. Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, no, it, to answer your first question, I I would not make the claim that this was in, inference over exclusion. Um, this was a really basic task, and I. To be totally honest with you, I wasn't that interested in the task itself. I was interested in using a very simple uh, iteration one step up from the basic olfaction task I was doing to see whether or not this might be a good way to move forward. I'd love to go back to it, um, and we could talk more about it in terms yeah. of doing the three cup task. Um, I will tell you that after doing object permanence with three buckets, mm -hmm. um, there's something about elephant motivation when it comes to I don't want to say increase in complexity, but when you increase visual stimuli for the elephants, and three buckets invariably is visual stimuli that they have in front of them, they seem to lose interest. Um, and I think a lot of it comes down to really how do you motivate an animal, especially a, a full-grown male or female, that is impossible to satiate. Um, the elephants are never satiated, um, and I think they have some level of motivation that's relatively steady and constant. So it's really difficult to manipulate the environment too much without losing their interest. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just, go ahead. Um, but I, I actually thought you were going to ask in terms of how I control olfaction. Was that something you were getting at as well? Because what you, you said that you know, you'd never seen it done with olfaction. Yeah. Um, and con controlling olfaction is really difficult. In terms of the quantity discrimination study I showed you with two buckets that both had food in it, yeah. Um, we had four or five different controls specifically to try to figure out whether or not there were other cues the elephants could have been picking up on. So okay. one example um, is I actually got this idea after I gave my job talk at the position I currently have at the City University of New York, um, where we were trying to figure out what Wait, if it's not, you, is there something else the elephants could have been doing, right? So one thing we thought 
is maybe, I mean, I think that the difference is so small that it would be difficult for this to be the case. But if you give them 150 versus 30 sunflower seeds, the 150 sunflower seeds is higher in the bucket. So maybe the elephants aren't telling the difference between more or less. They're simply choosing the food that's closer to their nose, right? Which is a much simpler ability. So we, five years later, I went back to the elephants. Five years later, I raised the food up to the same level and the elephants could still tell the difference. I have no idea how they did that, but they were still able to do that. We did controls to look at what we might call residual smell. Um, so if I show you six apples and two apples, and I say, here, look at these two, and then I remove them, there's no residual information left, right? The, the, the apples are not magically floating in the air in front of you still, they're gone. But if you're using olfactory information and I present you with olfactory information about the food and then I pull the food away, there is still residual odor left in the environment. So we did controls for that as well. In addition to experimental cueing and clever Hans sort of situations. Uh -huh. um, but just back to your question, I mean, I, I think there's a lot more to look at in terms of inference. Yeah. It just, in this particular experiment, you know, the, the, again, the most parsimonious explanation when you do this simple type of task is that they're simply avoiding the bucket without food. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering if um, for the first study you presented us today, um, the cooperation one with the buckets, I was wondering if you tried it with only one bucket so that only one elephant would get it. And if not, is it because it, it would upset one of the elephants? Yeah, so um, there are so many different iterations I would have loved to do with that cooperation task. And I still may do it at some point. Um, that particular experiment, which was done at, in my opinion, one of the best facilities in Thailand for elephants, it's government controlled, it's very well run, um, but it's also very bureaucratic. So I had a limited amount of time to do the research there. Um, videos I don't show in the presentation for obvious reasons are videos of what happens when the elephants don't get along, for instance. So what happens if you pair two elephants that don't get along, they physically attack each other, which can be very dangerous because um, in the wild, elephants don't usually attack each other. They're living in closely knit, socially bonded family groups. Um, I also have videos of elephants attacking their mahouts when they were held back waiting too long for the partner. Um, so in fact, you're effectively holding an elephant back from their food. So we had to be very careful in designing these experiments and that sets up competition. So competitive situations, which would be really interesting next steps, right? We're looking at mutualistic relationships here where effectively if you work together with me, we both get food. In that situation, it's if we work together, we either have to share or only one of us gets food, it's dangerous. I would love to do it, but I would have to figure out how to do it without causing a problem. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, in terms of uh, human-animal conflict, there's been a lot of research done with uh, canids, wolves, and coyotes, and how they uh, avoid uh, flatteries, which are barriers of simple fabric, pieces of fabric vertically disposed. Um, has things like that been tested with elephants? And also, as a sub-question, um, have we uh, looked at exploiting their natural fear, for example, fear of bees or uh, things like that in order to protect crops? Yeah, so um, excellent question. The first is that in, there is a, there's a, an explosion of the use of bees in Africa. So um, Lucy King, who works for Save the Elephants, which is a huge uh, African nonprofit, um, they have a project called the Elephant and Bees Project. And so they go to villages, um, primarily in Kenya, but I think they're expanding it throughout um, Africa, looking at um, setting up bee fences, which is a good thing for two reasons. One is that it works to deter elephants because the African honeybee is extremely aggressive. The elephants learn this. They learn the sound of bees. They learn to associate the sound of bees with pain, obviously. But also for the farmers, it introduces a crop, right? They can harvest honey and then they can sell it. Um, They've tried to do this in Asia. Um, there's some preliminary evidence that makes me a little optimistic in Sri Lanka, but I'm concerned about it for two reasons. One is that the Asian honeybee is far less aggressive. Um, so you really have to think about the ecological validity of it. But more importantly, um, I, my concern is that I still think that the elephants, when pushed to the brink, right, when they have less and less land, and we're not giving them more land now, we're taking it away more and more, they're gonna find a way around these fences as well. And in Africa, they have much more land 
to navigate, right? I'm not going to say unlimited land. They're constantly in conflict with people. But in Asia, they're, they're surrounded by people on all, er on all sides of the national parks. And if you continue to push them into that area, it doesn't matter what mitigation strategy you use. Eventually, if they have a need, they're going to try and, and to fulfill that need. The other thing they're using is chili fences in Asia. I think they're using it in Africa as well, chili. So you, in line with what you just suggested, you line a fence with chili. The elephants don't like the taste or the smell of it. And in some places, it deters the elephants. Again, I think these solutions have been used for so long because they do work. My concern is that, are they long-term solutions? Because they don't deal with the inherent problem, which is that the elephants have some reason for going to raid the crops. Now, something I should add that might be really interesting for all of you is that you might be thinking, well, they want the crops because it's high quality food, right? Inside the national park, they don't have this high quality food, so they're going out to get it, maybe. But what we're seeing is that some elephants raid crops for totally different reasons. There are several different groups of crop raiders, I would say, right? One we'll call systematic, right? These are the elephants that come out of national parks, they raid the crops, they go back in, maybe every night, or at least regularly, right? Then you have opportunistic elephants, elephants that leave crop areas and raid crops, uh, sorry, leave their national park and then they migrate or they move from one area to the next. And as they come across a high quality food, they eat it and then they move on to the next. The third group are the, uh, the I don't know what, what to call them, but these are the group of elephants um, that only raid crops when they really need it, right? So it might be the dry season or a, a time of high drought. So the elephants only come out when they really, really need it, right? Let's just necessity elephants. And then the final one, which is the one I'm most interested in, are the elephants I call the vindictive elephants. These are the elephants that raid croplands. And these, these examples come, in my, from what I know, exclusively in India at the moment. They come out, they raid crops, but they don't eat anything. They just destroy everything. So why are the elephants doing that? And, and I, would, I think we need to do research on this, but one hypothesis is that these are areas where the farmers are more aggressive towards the elephants, right? So as you become more aggressive towards the elephants, the elephants retaliate with a similar level of aggression, one hypothesis. But what's interesting is you see differences in their behavior, and it's not always about the high quality food. So that means, again, that behavior is really important Understanding elephant behavior is really important if we're going to come with long-term solutions. Uh, that's a very good point because in terms of individuality, uh, research done with canids, we found out that the, 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 the main couple that is uh, keeping a territory will seldom attack livestock. But if we eliminate those individuals and younger individuals take their place, then they will turn more likely to livestock because they have less experience as, as, as hunters. So that becomes a more natural mm. source of food. So it'd be interesting to see what research reveals in terms of individual uh, behaviors. Thank you. Hi, um, really fascinating talk, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I imagine at um, the facility that you're at, the elephants form really close bonds and relationships with their trainers. And I imagine during like the cooperation task, for example, the trainers are around. And I was just wondering, like especially during the ones where there's a delay before the companion elephant comes in or if they're paired with um, an elephant that they maybe don't get along with, do have you ever seen them try to recruit like the human trainer? And yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good question too. I mean, we, we, didn't, we didn't see anything in terms of at least in our hearing, uh, in our frequency um, capacity, I didn't hear anything in terms of communication with the other elephant or towards the mahout. And I think that's largely due to the fact that the elephants learned very quickly how the task worked, right? So there wasn't a need for recruiting because they knew that eventually another elephant would come. Um, we controlled for the mahouts to make sure the mahouts weren't providing any sort of cue. Um, but that, that is a really interesting question and, and something that we would have liked to have done, and I actually am thinking about doing it with a different group of elephants, is to introduce the mahout as the partner, right? To see what, because I think in that situation, it's much more likely that the, that the mahout will be recruited. Um, the Japanese lab, um, Satoshi Harada, um, who comes from Kyoto, his research with chimpanzees in this domain shows that chimpanzees are much more likely to recruit a human partner. So he did an experiment, and I, I can show you the video later if you're interested, um, where he blocked a food source with a big rock. Um, and the rock needed to be pulled from two handles to get the rock to move off of the food source that was in the hole. The chimpanzees were not good at doing this with other chimps, but they were really good eventually at going over and recruiting the human partner to help them 
pull the food. Now, there could be many reasons for this. I think the primary reason is that the human's not a competitor, right? With a chimpanzee, you're competing for the food. With the human experimenter, you're not. Probably a similar situation for the elephants. Um, I rarely see elephants compete over food resources. I think it's, again, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that they don't, that because they eat so much food, that they have some level of hunger all the time. I don't, know, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's some steady level of hunger that prevents them from having this high desire to compete over food resources. I will give you an anecdote. Um, this is not going off on a tangent, but just an idea here. Um, I was working with a group of elephants where, where two, elef two females got along really well. They spent all their time together. They were not related. One, we believe, was completely blind. Um, and although her partner spent a lot of time with her and showed a lot of signs of consolation regularly when her friend got distressed, what I did see sometimes was her steal food from her friend. It was the only time I'd seen that regularly where she would reach out and scoop food that was in front of her friend away from her. So I wouldn't call that competition, but I'd call it some sort of social understanding with regards to high quality food. Thank you. Sure. Hi, um, fascinating talk. I'm really fascinated by uh, your approach to education. So getting kids into research, getting them to design experiments with you and write papers, I think it's completely amazing. And, and I would love to hear you more talk about it. Like, is your approach uh, to disseminate knowledge widespread within the scientific community? Because it, like, this seems to me like it would be the most effective way to change minds towards animals. Like. Uh, uh, and if it's not, like, how did you come up with it? Like, uh, do high school reach out for you or do you reach out, like, are you the one going for high schools and stuff? Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Um, to answer your first question, I mean, I, scientists are really busy. <laughs> um, and I, I'm very lucky in that I work with a charismatic species that people care about, right? I mean, and I don't think it's fair to say that I, that our research deserves more attention than the research of people who work with lesser known or let's say less charismatic species. But um, I think there's a lot of people, including some people in this room, who do research that's really exciting that we need to find ways to better translate for young people. Um, you know, and, and the elephant's a great, is a great hook. And that's, that's kind of how I, I think of the elephant as a hook to get children interested in this type of research. Um, so one thing is to, is to get them interested in, in studying animal behavior, um, because as many of you know, there are virtually no jobs in academia when it comes to pure ethology um, or even comparative psychology anymore. Um, so the more people I think that are interested in this topic, the more likely is there to be more funding for it. Um, so yes, I would like to see it become more widespread. Um, if scientists can find the time, and I think many do in many different ways, to bring their research into classrooms for young people, I think would be really important. Um, our research is only as, as important as the people that are interested in learning about it, honestly, and hearing about it and understanding it. Um, but to answer your second question, um, it's kind of a wild story, but when I was eight years old, I used to write letters to every children's book author. To every children's book I read, I wrote a little letter to an, the author of the book. And one of them became a pen pal of mine, and he eventually became, 20 years later, a middle school principal. And he and I continued to stay in touch. Um, and I said, hey, maybe I could do a presentation for your students. And he said, that'd be great. And the kids were really captivated by the work. They asked me really great questions. And I started to think this could be something that we could expand. Um, so long story short, I started a nonprofit that's called Think Elephants International. Um, and that nonprofit, which is separate from my academic work, but still you know, helps to kind of combine the two, um, focuses on raising awareness and raising funds for research in the field, but also conservation education. So that um, through private donations and also some federal support um, at the US level, which you can imagine may not be as easy to get anymore, um, was, was funding that helped us to do the first iteration of this project in New York City schools. Um, we got funding from the US government actually to, to expand it in Thailand. So we ran a, a pilot program with I think 12 to 15 schools, I'm forgetting the exact number, both in Bangkok and in Ganchanabri, another province. Ganchanabri is a province where elephants are constantly raiding crops. So in those schools, you have kids who are personally affected by elephants. In Bangkok, you have wealthy kids who are quite often consumers who are buying products that affect wildlife, but also are the children of politicians who make the laws that affect wildlife. So what we were trying to do and will continue to try to do is to target children 
or educate a whole variety of kids, those kids directly affected by wildlife and those that could have an impact, right? You know, I always, I, I give you that saving space example of that game because it's something that anybody can do with any child, right? If you in this classroom are thinking, well, I don't live next to elephants, how can I help them? And Canada is much better that, at this than the United States. When you go, to the, you go to the supermarket, say no to a plastic bag, right? Say no to a plastic straw. It's that simple to have a long-term impact if a lot of people do it. And those are the little things that anybody can do in a classroom, but our nonprofit is largely focused on doing it on a, a hopefully a larger scale and not just with elephants. And so the idea is that we did, el we did research with elephants. A large part of our education program um, focuses on animal behavior research and conservation. So scientists, our goal in the future is if we're working in a place, let's say we're working in New York City in the future again, which we will, doesn't have to be with elephants. There are thousands of species um, some undiscovered and unnamed in Central Park alone, right? So you could have science, local ecologists in New York City take a group of kids to a park and do a study with them there, right? It's all about engaging kids and getting them to think critically. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Monica, and I have two questions. <laughs> uh, that repetitive behavior, uh, with the elephant swinging the trunk and waiting for the uh, offering of the food, uh, could it be a kind of ritualistic adjunctive behavior, like uh, seen with some other animals, like in, uh, pigeons in skin a box, that that it's anxiety um, enthusiastic for something? Yeah, I mean, I think so. The reason I actually specifically focused on that behavior is that because in captivity, you often see that sort of repetitive behavior from elephants that are kept in confined environments. We don't know what it means. Yes. Um, it, not, it, is not, it's, it, it is not necessarily a high level of stress. It could simply be no, no. Um, you're dealing with boredom. It's not good behavior to see, honestly. But in this case, this is an elephant that never does that. So it's certainly, I mean, I think at the most basic level, it's anticipatory. He's certainly anticipating that a food is going yes. to be provided to him, whether it's excitement um, yes. or anxiety. I doubt it's anxiety because this is an elephant that I think, I, you know, yes, with, I, at the risk of sounding a little anthropomorphic, I think is really excited about participating in our experiments because we provide him with a high quality food resource. The other thing is that, you know, working with animals in captivity, I sometimes argue that it's better to work with animals in bad situations because these are animals that have no opportunity for cognitive or behavioral stimulation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I work with better facilities largely because I have an opportunity to do more education in those facilities. Um, but you know, if, if my goal is not only to study elephants, but also to improve their livelihoods, then I think, you know, even if you just provide them with a simple experiment like this, it, it can provide a high level of enrichment for them. Um, so to answer your question, I, I, I think it's some level of, of anticipation and excitement for sure. Yes, um, I'm sorry for my words because I, I don't do the, the exact translation. No, it's I'm, fine. I'm Brazilian and I don't know exactly what to, how to translate something. When I say anxiety, I think I was thinking at a kind of excitement. Really. Yeah, I think in, in terms of actual anxiety, I think the concern would be, you know, if, if, if it was something that was in a Skinner box, the pigeon is potentially anxious because they might get a shock or yes, there's another yes. potential negative stimuli or a response that could potentially happen. In this case, that's not, that's not the case. We, did, yes. we never punished elephants for not doing well in a task. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking this because I, I thought that this could be a kind of affective um, system working, a uh, kind of seeking system, uh, wanting system, and we have all names for this system. And the other question is about that uh, photo that I, that I saw the trunk at the face of a, of a woman. Yeah. And I thought that, uh, yes, this one. He can recognize emotion, faces, expressions? I doubt it. From a, 
from a visual perspective, I would doubt it. Yeah. I, I think this is just and this is just a funny photo I put up there. Uh, and she happens to be one of the only female mahouts in all of Thailand. In fact, all of Asia, to my knowledge. Um, and she raised this female elephant from when she was a newborn calf. Um, again, this is a situation where the elephant's just using olfactory information to, okay. or tactile information. Right? It's difficult to know what the elephant's doing in this case. Um, but we don't have any any information on their ability to read human emotions. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I would be shocked if they weren't able to do it at some level, certainly because they were attuned to their mahouts. Um, Sorry, um, I don't understand. So they're, they're, they're paying attention to their mahouts emotional state when the mahout's angry, right? If the mahout is angry, it's pretty obvious that the elephant knows okay. right? because there's a chance that the elephant's going to be punished. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So we have time for just a couple more questions. So we've got five minutes left. I'm interested in that replication you did of the African elephant uh, study. Yeah. Because I actually had an assignment to do about this a few years ago. So I read this article quite a few times. And I do remember that they did their best at least to control for the olfactory um, information. I believe they, if my memory is right, they use the same fruit smell in both uh, both buckets or they, they had a control group or something like that. Well, they had a control at least uh, or they swapped them or something. So, um, uh, and I was curious to know if this study would get replicated. So it's, it's a nice coincidence that I'm actually hearing about your speech. Um, do you think there was something wrong with the way that they possibly, what's, where did they go wrong if they went, went wrong in any way? Uh, in any case, if they somehow went wrong, what could possibly go wrong? And um, one last thing, do you think it could be socially learned? Because we point to things and they sort of just figured out that it, because they do as well, right? Yeah, so to answer your second question first, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, we, for each of these experiments, we ran approximately 40 trials. Right. And the idea there is we tried to come up with a number that would allow them to at least recognize how the task worked, but not allow them to necessarily learn contingencies about the task. Right. Because I'm not interested in associative learning when I design these experiments. I'm interested in what particular sensory information is the elephant's most important. Right. What mm -hmm. do they pay attention to first? Um, so I think it's very possible that they could learn what the point means over time. The African I, ones might have just been biased because of that. Yeah, I mean, okay. um, I, I'm, I'm colleagues with those, with those scientists, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, the, the criticism is entirely about the fact that they, they make an argument um, that the elephants have no experience whatsoever with the point mm -hmm. um, and that they, they just learn to follow it very quickly. I have questions about that. I wonder if, if they really didn't have any experience with it. It's very difficult to make a claim that if you have people working closely with elephants that they never, that they've never seen a social cue before. Mm -hmm. And I never made that argument. The, the Mahouts told me they sell a cue all the time. Um, and in terms of your olfactory point, we didn't control for olfaction on purpose because I wanted to see whether or not, you know, okay, well, let's just put the food out there and see what happens. And the elephants still couldn't do it. Mm. Um, and, and I don't know what that means. You know, we used an apple, so there's not a lot of olfactory information from a distance, I think, from a single apple. Difficult to know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, as, as the scientist who's now shown negative results twice, it's difficult for me to make a claim in the opposite direction. But, but I, I think it's largely due to the fact that this is just not a salient cue for an elephant. I, do, they, do I think they could learn it? Yes. And, and maybe that's what happened in Africa. It's really, it, it's a, it's an interesting question. That's why I throw out the ecological answer, right? Maybe it's difference in species. Um, but you know, it, with elephants, considering how little research is done on their behavior and cognition in a controlled environment, I, I lean towards a methodological problem. So just one last question. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so just in, when that uh, kind of table of results you put up, you know, kind of summarizing all the different uh, tasks that elephants have, have succeeded on, I found that really interesting. Um, but what do you think that says about the nature of intelligence, um, particularly in elephants? Do you think they've got that this is like general intelligence being applied to lots of different problems, or these are lots of abilities that have evolved independently? What's your, what's your view on that? Yeah, that's a... 
That's an, I, I don't have one yet. I, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and I should add that they didn't succeed at all of these. These are all the ones I've studied. Some of them have been published, some are writing up. Um, but yes, they have succeeded in a lot of these. Um, they're, they're, there's a lot of argument in the literature about this, right? Whether or not some of these species are generalists, right? So they evolved particular capacities or they evolved a general um, level of cognitive complexity that allows them to be flexible in a lot of different cognitive domains or problem solving tasks. Um, you know, and there are two, com I wouldn't say these are competing hypotheses. I think that, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but the physical intelligence hypothesis and the social intelligence hypothesis, I, I briefly touched on them earlier, but really quickly, physical intelligence hypothesis arguing that um, some animals evolved um, the need for complex cognition in the physical domain because they needed flexibility in their ability to solve um, complex physical tasks. And that would be primarily in terms of tool use. Social intelligence being the idea that social complexity is required and flexibility in social interactions is required to deal with a difficult social environment or a difficult environment that requires um, complex sociality. I think for the elephants, it's largely the social idea. They have a built-in tool. Right? There's no need for flexibility in artificial tool use. The elephant has a built-in tool, the trunk, 20,000 muscles, extremely flexible. I think because of how much we know about the elephant's complex social behavior um, and their large brains, um, I would argue that they have evolved um, cognitive complexity primarily in the social domain that's allowed them to generalize to some of these other traits. Sorry we else? have to cut it off, but it'll continue in the panel. <laughs> But you can ask more questions at two, and the panel is at two o'clock, not at four o'clock today. Thank you. Let's uh, thank him again. Thank you.